All right, let's do Children's Church, otherwise known as Kids Church. My wife doesn't like it when I call them kids. She says I'm talking about goats. Thank you, Mom. How about chapter four? Thank you. Chapter four, the book of John. You guys want to switch me on the back there? We're continuing second week in uh, chapter four. Looking at, uh, we see Jesus now. He's been in the south, around working, uh, preaching around Jerusalem, and now he's uh, moving to the north. His ministry has been flourishing to the point where it's, it is superseding John the Baptist. Remember, there's a transitional page, uh, time here. And the religious elite, the Pharisees, uh, are becoming resentful of Jesus. Each and every day it grows, their resentment. So he decides it's time for him to move north to uh, Galilee, closer to his home. Because at this time he desires no confrontation with them. The time for confrontation is still away. So uh, he moves, decides he's going to move north. So our source scripture this morning is from John 4. We'll look at verses 3 through 9. John 4, 3 through 9. If you're ready for the word of God, would you signify that by saying amen? amen. And if you're able, would you stand with me out of respect to the reading of the word of God? John the apostle writes in John 4, 3. He left Judea and departed again to Gal Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Shekhar, near the plot of ground that Joseph gave, or Jacob gave, gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a woman from me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans? You can be seated. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, Jesus, in his ministry, it was never necessary for him to test his opponents, his enemies. From the moment Jesus began to teach and preach, they were after him. In John 7.30, it says they were seeking to seize him. And no man, to quote, it says, no man, no man laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come. In 820, it says he spoke these words in the treasury, in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. See, Jesus was on a different time schedule than everyone else. His time schedule was a divine time schedule, and he took ste steps throughout his ministry to avoid these confrontations with the religious elite. And he took steps both naturally, like moving to a different area, and supernaturally every once in a while. Remember, in, in his own home city of Nazareth, they tried to kill him. And what does the scripture say? He disappeared. He was gone from their midst. So Jesus is preparing to go to Galilee, Galilee and he's going to go there for what we refer to as his great Galilean ministry. In order to get there, he's going to pass through 
Samaria. Some would say you have to go through Samaria, but in reality, you don't have to go through Samaria. You could go the coastal route to the west of Samaria. Uh, you know, if you're going to go to Ga uh, Galilee from Jerusalem, Galilee's up north, Jerusalem in the south, you could go to the west along the coastal plain, or you could even go over the River Jordan and go up the east side of Samaria and cross back over and go into uh, Galilee that way, go through the region that's called Perea. Uh, but the most direct route would take you through Samaria. But, but, an important but, but, any fastidious, orthodox, devout Jew would never go through Samaria because they would be concerned that, that the feet on their, the dust on their feet would defile them. So they would either take the coastal route or they would take the other route and go around Samaria. But Jesus passes right through Samaria. And in the Greek, when you read this in the Greek, where it says he needed to go through Samaria, that could better be translated, it was necessary for him to go through Samaria. You can almost think of it was required for him to go through Samaria. Now, some people will say, well, he went through Samaria because it's the shortest route. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think, uh, yes, he wanted to get to Galilee. But I think it had, you have to go beyond that because everything with, with the, our Lord and Savior has a purpose. And what it says to me is that he went through Samaria because he had a sovereign appointment. You're not lying the word sovereign. There, Jesus was scheduled to meet a woman by a well. That had, and that, that meeting had been ordained by God before the foundation of the world. And if that meeting is going to lead to her salvation, and then the salvation of numerous other people in her village. Okay? So he had to go that way. It was necessary. It was required. There's more than just a geographic compulsion here. There's a spiritual for, foreordained necessity. The machi machinery of divine sovereignty, the machinery of supernatural purpose was in motion as Jesus headed north to meet one surprised sinful woman at a well. Now to look at things from a little historical context as I do, Samaria was originally the capital city of the northern kingdom. When did the kingdom split up? Who was the last king of the United Kingdoms? Solomon. Solomon, right? So the two, ten tribes went north, two tribes stayed in the south. The south became known as Judah. The north became known as Israel. And when the, the kingdom in the north was established, it was established by King Omri, O-M-R-I, Omri. And he was as all the other kings of the northern kingdom. Every one of them had things in common. They were all evil, they were all wicked, and they were all unrighteous. Every king of the northern, of the northern kingdom. So in 1 Kings 16, Omri decides he's going to identify the capital city of his kingdom as Samaria. And not long after that, the entire northern kingdom became known as Samaria in a kind of derisive way by those that lived in the south. The Samaritans were unpure people. So in Samaria, somewhere along the way, there's this village, this, the village called Shekhar, which is, we believe, uh, pretty, uh, pretty confidently is by a, a, a present-day city named as Ashkar. And so Jesus came to that place, a city in Samaria. Uh, and we can assume that Jesus, I think, uh, from the reading that we've already read, from the things we look at in the four Gospels all together, Jesus has been staying down in Jerusalem. Probably, uh, maybe, I think, he was probably staying in Bethany. 
He may have, in fact, been staying at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, a very, very close friends of his throughout his ministry. But if he is in Bethany, let's assume that for sake of discussion, to get where he's going, he's going to go on a 20-mile hike. All right? And when I define it as a hike, it's a hike. It's up and down and up. Not mountainous, but it's very hilly. It's an arduous walk, if you will. Okay? It's not, it's not like out here we've got, you know, a lot of flat land. It's kind of like walking the golf course. You know, on the golf course there's some flat holes, but there's some terrible holes too, where if you're walking, I would never make it if I was walking. But Jesus came to this place, and uh, which is further identified in the scripture for us. Uh, the, 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 the scriptures like to identify things to us. It's identified to us by a place where Jacob purchased land, where he dug a well, which subsequently was uh, bequeathed to his son Joseph. And Joseph actually was later buried in this area. And the Bible likes to give us those t that type of in information, uh, historical, geographical information. The Bible loves to do that because the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, is a real book. Amen. And it is about real people. And these real people are doing real things. And they live in real places. The Bible is a real book. So Jesus travels approximately 20 miles. And he arrives at a place near Shechem by Jacob's well. And we know that, we know where Jacob's well is today. It's been identified geographically. And you can go there if you want. But it's about a mile, a half mile to a mile from where this city, Shakar, actually was. And Jesus arrives at this place. And we, we read that it says that Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. So what does it mean? He sat thus by the well. Well, what was he? <coughs> so how did he sit? Tired. He sat wearily. Have you ever sat wearily? Yeah. As I get older, I sit wearily more often. <laughs> but Jesus sat thus by the well. <coughs> and it means he has a wearied condition. He sat probably slumped, tired. This, it's about the sixth hour, we're told. The day began at dawn. He would have left early in the morning to make this trip. Uh, the day began at 6 a.m., so it's about noon, the middle of the day. The sun is at its peak, and he's walked 20 miles up and down these hills. It's a rigorous walk, and he's exhausted. And in the word, in the, that Greek, worried in the Greek, kopieo, uh, means to be exhausted or sweaty. He's worn out. He's underneath the noonday sun and he sits on the edge of this well. So that sets the stage for us for this amazing encounter. And again here, you get to see the humanity of Jesus. I don't know about you, but for me, it's comforting to know that Jesus understands what we suffer as men and women. Isn't it comfort you? Okay. That Jesus was one of us. He's like us. He knew what it meant to be tired and weary and thirsty, to be worn out, to be exhausted. Okay. And that that it contributes to his ability to be a sympathetic high priest who learned from his own earthly experience what it is to be like we are. Mm -hmm. Jesus walked in our flesh, and he understands even our physical weariness. So we come to this encounter, and I want to give you some points now as we go through this encounter. Remember, we're looking at this encounter as a model for you and I to personally evangelize other people, all right? This is how Jesus did it. So you think it might be a good model for you and I? If it was good enough for him, 
I would think it would be good enough for us. The first point is that what we see here is an un unexpected condescension on the part of Jesus. And what I mean by condescension, come with me here, is that Jesus takes the initiative and comes into the lady's world. He doesn't ask her to jump up into his world. And it's important for you to remember that if you try to speak to somebody of the gospel, don't speak to them as if they are theologians. Speak to them in their own language. Verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. I'm going to stop right there. That's an eight-hole word, so I have to stop right there. But this woman is drawing water, and drawing water in that day is woman's work. They did it every day, because they needed water every day. Water was scarce in that part of the world, and wells were visited daily. A common meeting place for community communication. You know another word for that? Gossip, Gossip exactly. Community communication. But what's fascinating here is that typically the, the women would come to the well at dusk. Why? It's cooler. Amen? Cooler. That's why I took off my coat, so I would be cooler. <laughs> but they came to the well each day in the evenings, and they would sit around, and they would talk as they drew water. But this woman is coming to the well at noon. Now, we can't be certain why, but it would be reasonable, I think, to assume that the re reason why the woman is coming to the well at noon is because of who the woman is. She has a bad reputation. How many husbands has she had? Five husbands. And now she's living in adultery. And you know, the Samaritan religion is based upon the Pentateuch, which contains a lot of references to marriage and divorce and adultery, et cetera, et cetera, about what's wrong with that. So she is, in fact, a social outcast. She would normally come at dusk like all the other women, but as a woman of shame, she came at noon because she knows, and I think she hopes, nobody else is going to be at the well. Have you ever gone anywhere at a specific time, or have you ever gone any place just because you hoped you wouldn't see anybody else there? <laughs> I have. You know what? God knows where you're going, what time you're going to be there. So get over whatever inhibitions you might have. Give those inhibitions to God and let Him take care of them for you. You know, I, I imagine. She's trying to avoid confrontation. She doesn't want to talk to certain people. She's, she wants to avoid the disgrace that she bears. And you may, I, another thing to ask is why is she going to this well? Because it's a famous well? No. Between where the town of Shekhar is and this well, there's two or three other wells on the way. She walks to the furthest well. Why? She wants to make sure there's nobody else at that well. At least that's the way I see it. She wants to avoid any scorn of other woman that she might have to face. Because she is not a respectable person. Have you ever not been a respectable person? You know, all the, all the, listen, some people have a view of Jesus Christ and Christianity, and they would see this, their expectation would be that this type of woman would not be worthy of any attention from the Son of God. She's not a woman who in any way, shape, or form is socially elevated. And this is the condescension, if you will, 
how does Jesus begin to speak to her? He speaks to her as he would speak to anyone. He takes the initiative. He comes to her level and he says, give me a drink. Now those words, give me a drink, are shocking, shocking words. Maybe not so much in today's culture, but in that culture, that's a shocking thing for him to do. Because in that culture, men do not speak to women in public. And it's still the same way in middle, many Middle Eastern countries. Men will not speak to a woman in public. That's a breach of social etiquette. It's a breach of religious etiquette. And this man, who has already been identified as a rabbi, a teacher, a religious leader, they would never speak to a woman in public. Jewish men did not speak to women in public. So here's G Jesus, a Jewish man, who's already been recognized, as I said, as being a teacher. Not only does he talk to the woman, but he talks to a woman who is a outcast, despised, a half-breed pagan, and worse than that, she is by every measure a well-known adulteress and has probably been an adulteress for a long, long time. She is the immoral woman. And it's a shocking breach of everything Jewish for him to say to this woman, give me a drink. And you might ask, well, why didn't he ask his disciples to give him a drink? Well, verse 8, what did he do with his disciples? He sent them away. Sent all his disciples to go buy food. So he's there alone with her. And I imagine they needed food, but how many disciples does it take to go buy food? Think it takes all of them? Okay. Uh, I think he's dismissing them because it's beneficial to the conversation that he wants to have. Let's, let's say it that way. He wanted to be with himself and the woman alone. And without them to get him a drink, because they would have, you know, if he asked her for a drink, what do you think one of the disciples would be? Oh, no, Savior, let me get it for you. And he doesn't have anything to drink with. He doesn't have an instrument to drink with. He doesn't have a cup or a ladle. So he says to the woman, give me a drink. And by the way, just a footnote here, Jesus, throughout the Gospels, never did one miracle to quench his own thirst. He never did one miracle to satisfy his own hunger or to provide anything else for himself. There's no record in the four gospel that Jesus ever did anything to provide for himself. He always did everything in the area of miracles to provide for others. Jesus, this is a lesson that America should learn, Jesus honored work. Jesus honored effort. Jesus honored care for each other. Jesus honored sacrifice. He honored giving. He honored whatever you needed to do to sustain lives on our own. And we should get, we should get what, he, his philosophy is that we should get what we need either through our own work and our own effort, or by somebody else's work or somebody else's effort who then gave to us out of kindness. Never does Jesus advocate the receipt of free things by the government. Never, ever. He didn't do those kind of miracles. He didn't live that kind of life. He would supply other people's needs. So the woman responds in verse 9, and she says to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? And then the, John the Apostle, who does this pretty often in his gospel, in parentheses, you can think of it that way, he writes, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. That's the way it's been translated to the English. I'll tell you what the Greek says 
in the Greek it says, the verb literally says they don't use the same utensils. Samaritans and Jews don't use the same utensils. They don't drink out of the same cup. They don't drink out of the same label. Very specific. She is saying, I know your culture. I know what your culture believes about Samaritans, so why in the world, considering what you think about us, would you ask me for a drink? See, the thing about Samaria is, Samaria should have been overrun with missionaries. Okay? Should have been full of people seeking to uh, spread the word of God. But the problem is, is that the nation Israel had become a nation of Jonas. A nation of Jonas who didn't want to take the message, really, to anybody. Did Jonah want to evangelize anybody? No. And these are Samaritans. So instead of, instead of, instead of the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders of the South going to the Samaritans and telling them the truth instead of drawing them to true knowledge of the true God through the true scriptures, the, tr the, the Jews treat the Samaritans like they are subhuman, much the way they treated the Gentile. And so the woman knows about that and she knows that they don't share anything and she says, how is it that you being a Jew and how did she know he was a Jew? Probably because of his clothes, yeah. As a rabbi, he would have tassels on his robe. Distinct clothing that Jews wore. In Numbers 15, you can read about the clothing. A rabbi would wear those type of things. But let me add another note here, that this is, in fact, just a Jewish man. He doesn't, he, that he's, he, his humanity, we've just heard how he's tired, right? He doesn't have a halo around his head. He doesn't, have, you ever see those pictures with a light behind Jesus? Mm -hmm. He doesn't have a light behind him. In fact, and this is, I've got three stars on my, my manuscript. This is important. Jesus and his teaching is totally indifferent towards non-biblical traditions. That's an important thing for you to remember. If you are confronted with a decision in the church over whether something is wrong or something is right, and if you're ever told that it's right because that's the way we've always done it, be concerned. What you need to find out is, is it in the word of God. You know, I was in a church not long after I was uh, first saved, and on a Sunday night service, somebody put a set of drums on the platform. It was almost all over. Yeah. So be concerned about any tradition that is not substantiated by the word of God. See, look at Jesus. What did he send his disciples to do? Go buy food. Who are they going to buy the food from? Those, those Samaritans. And who do you think made the food? Those dirty Samaritan hands and fingers. Okay. Was Jesus a traditionalist? No. In fact, Jesus would flaunt his non-traditionalist attitude. He didn't care for these traditions that had grown up in the beliefs of Judaism. These, these traditions that had been created by men. Things that essentially shut off other people from the glory of God. Things that Jesus would say were a violation of God's will and were irreflective of God's heart. Jesus 
See, if the Jews had done what the Jews were supposed to do, God wouldn't have had to send his son to die on the cross. The Jews were supposed to go out into the world and profess who God was to the world. But God, because of the failure of his chosen people, had to send his son. God knew what was going to happen. But because of the religious leaders of his own people, he had to send his son. And, you know, the religious leaders of Israel, they, listen, the religious leaders of Israel weren't interested in converting their own people. Never mind converting those dirty Samaritans. John adds for us, it's, he says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. They don't use the same utensils. And it, I, I, as I was looking at this, I found it interesting. You know, it rang a bell as I was thinking about this. And I looked at John 8, 48, where the Jews come to Jesus and they accuse him. John 8, 48. Do we not say rightly that you, are a Samaritan and have a demon. That's what they said to Jesus. You're a demon-possessed Samaritan. Well, I wouldn't want to be the dude that said those words. Can you imagine? They had such terrible scorn for Samaritans. But the most important thing take away from this message today isn't the attitude of the Pharisees. It's the attitude of Jesus Christ. See, with Jesus Christ, there are no borders. With Jesus Christ, you don't have to be good enough. All you got to do is believe. And there's people today that have never been able to fully place their belief in Jesus. I see it in your face. Just allow him to come to you at your own personal well today. Maybe you've tried. Try again. Maybe you've professed your faith in front of the church. Profess it again. Maybe, maybe you've done everything you can do of your own free will. Stop. Just believe. Our praise and worship team will come forward now. And we'll give the Lord some opportunity to speak on your heart today. We've been looking at how Jesus uh, had a divine appointment how he manifested his humanity. We've seen how he uh, was willing to come to this lady at her own level. How he is willing today to come to each of us. Jesus, listen, Jesus will meet you where you are. Don't think that he won't, because he will. He's ready for you today. Let's all stand and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just give this time to you. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here today, and I, Lord, uh, you place things on my heart. I, I can't place things on my own heart. I've been accused of sometimes being heartless. You wouldn't know about that. But Lord, uh, you've placed on my heart today that there's those here today that need you. They need you desperately. Some, Lord, that have, have never professed you and others that have professed you. Either way, either or, Lord, I've seen, I've seen an elder come forward in a church and a man who was part of the leadership of the church who, uh, after 30 years in the church, finally accepted Christ as his Savior. So, Lord, I know how you work in lives, how you work in hearts. 
And Lord, we just come before you today to give this time to you. Lord, we ask, we cry out for your forgiveness. We ask, Lord, that we would lay our prayer, our sins at your feet as we pray to you today and allow you to work through our lives. Help us, Father, to see who and how you can be in our lives. Help us, Lord, to be drawn to you as you seek us out, your word tells us. Help us to open our hearts. Our Savior is knocking at the door. And it's my prayer today, Lord, that we would open it up. Whatever the need might be, Lord, we give this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.